Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of the Darwin Day Lecture. This year, we have the pleasure and the honor to have with us Professor Leslie Hlusko, who will be talking about a fascinating and appropriate talking for such a special day, which is Evolution Biology of the Primate Dentition 150 Years After Darwin. Leslie is a specialist in the genetic and developmental basis of mammalian skeletal variation and evolution with a special research focus on the evolution of primate dentition. She is research professor at the Department of Integrative Biology of Berkeley University in California. But I'm so happy to share openly here with all of you the great news that very soon, hopefully in a few weeks, Leslie will be joining us at CENIE, becoming a research professor at the CENIE within our dental anthropology group in the biology program. So we really think this is a very exciting period from all of us, and we hope that for you, Leslie, too. May this Darwin lecture also serve as a welcome party for you, Leslie, and our warmest wish for a fruitful and flourishing stage for evolutionary biology for you among us. So I think uh, this is great. Uh, whenever you are ready, I'm just letting know people that if you have any questions, you can do through the chat of the YouTube channel. And okay, welcome, Leslie, and let's celebrate with you our Charles Darwin Day. Thank you. Oh, gracias. It is an honor to be invited to give this lecture, especially at the end of the Woman in Science Week organized by the NIA and the University of Burgos. Thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this and especially to give a lecture in celebration of Darwin's birthday. So Darwin is of course um, most famous for writing on the origin of species, but in that book, he says almost nothing about humans. And since this lecture is hosted by Thinea, which is of course all about human evolution, I decided to turn to the book Darwin did write about humans. And I'll put, turn on my slides now. Here we go. There, can you see that okay? Yes. So the book that Darwin did write about humans, entirely all about humans, was The Descent of Man, published in 1871. As was typical at the time, 150 years ago, Darwin included women in the word man, but that inclusion was not one of equality. So for example, towards the end of his book, Darwin writes, Man is more powerful in body and mind than woman. This meant that, uh, and that therefore it is not surprising that he should have gained the power of selection. So what he meant by this is that men drive the selective process on women, selecting the most desirable traits. And his evidence for this is that women are everywhere conscious of the value of their own beauty. So Darwin interpreted the evolution of humans today to primarily be driven by men's preferences for beautiful women. At the end of the last few days, I think women, especially in Borgos, are also conscious of the value of their scientific abilities. In this talk, I will show you that the environment is a much stronger evolutionary force than our men's preferences of what women look like. So for this celebration of Charles Darwin's 212th birthday and 150 years after he published The Descent of Man, I will take you on a journey about teeth. <laughs> teeth? <laughs> yes, teeth. Specifically, we will talk about human teeth, the human dentition. In The Descent of Man, Darwin makes three observations about the evolution of the human dentition. We will look at each of these observations and I will update you on where the science stands. The first two we will cover quickly. But as for Darwin's third observation, this is a pretty exciting research area these days. 
And my own recent research reveals some interesting insights about the incredibly important role of natural selection on women. So one of Darwin's observations about teeth was about canines. So based on what he knew about teeth of other, other living primates, he thought that for our long ago ancestors, that the males had great canine teeth, meaning that they were large and therefore served them as formidable weapons. For example, baboons. So this male baboon has very large canines, as you can see, or some people might call them fangs. <laughs> but baboons, they do not hunt like big cats. Instead, they use these canines primarily for fighting with other baboons. And what do baboons mostly fight over? Rank in society, their hierarchy, who has the most power in the troop of baboons. And what does power give them? Access to females, sex. They use their canines primarily to fight over who gets to have sex. Gorillas, chimpanzees, many primate species, the males have particularly large canines and they use them to fight with other males. So Darwin was aware of this, of course, and he compared the canines of a chimpanzee, as you see here on the left, with those of a human, as you see here on the right. Darwin figured that the earliest ancestors of humans would have had teeth like the chimpanzee, and especially those very large canines. But Darwin was missing an important data point for his research. All that he had to work with were living animals. But what about the animals in the past, the extinct animals? For that, you have to turn to fossils. Now, as paleontologists conducted field studies over that intervening century, we began to collect data about what extinct animals actually looked like, including human ancestors. Projects such as the one that Dr. Seleshi Samao at the Thinia in the Gona of Ethiopia, as fossils were discovered from sites like this, the data, the fossils, showed that Darwin's interpretation was incorrect. The fossils enabled us, enabled us to test Darwin's hypothesis. Dental remains of the genus Ardipithecus show us what the canines of our ancestors 4.4 million years ago actually looked like. And what we see is that they are much smaller than those of a chimpanzee, much more like people today. Our ancestors, they stopped using their teeth as weapons very early on in our evolutionary history. So Darwin's inference that our earliest ancestors used their canines as weapons, well, discoveries from the fossil record provided the evidence we needed to test this, hypo this hypothesis, and we now know it was wrong. So what else did Darwin say about teeth? As man gradually became erect and continually used his hands and arms for fighting with sticks and stones, he would have used his jaws and teeth less and less. The size of the canines would have reduced through dis disuse. Well, we can also turn to the fossil record for the evidence needed to test this hypothesis. For example, another Thinia scientist, Dr. Gomez's research at Old Divide Gorge in Tanzania. The century of research done at this amazing site has recovered not just the bones of human ancestors, but also their stone tools and the bones of the animals they butchered with those stone tools. The fossil record shows us that our ancestors first had the reduction in the size of their teeth, and then they started using tools. Darwin had the order of events backwards. And so we need to reject this second hypothesis that Darwin proposed. 
Now, it isn't that Darwin was just wrong. He based these ideas on the evidence that he had at the time. All of the research to recover the fossil and archaeological evidence of human evolution since has revised our understanding of that evolution significantly. Now, we still have one more of Darwin's hypotheses to explore. He wrote, an eminent dentist assures me that there is nearly as much diversity in the teeth as in the features. <laughs> so thinking about the anatomical variation between people here, that teeth vary as much um, as other fe features. And he gets this information from an eminent dentist. <laughs> now, when a dentist tells you something, <laughs> we all know that we should listen. Now, at the time, Darwin did not actually have, he didn't have much actual evidence of what that diversity in the human dentition looked like. Today, we are greatly advantaged. Over the last 150 years, scientists, dental anthropologists, have collected data from the teeth of tens of thousands of people from around the world and through archaeological time. Now that eminent dentist was absolutely correct. There is a lot of variation and the way that the variation is distributed around the world, it tells us a lot about our evolutionary past. I wanna tell you the story of just one particular dental characteristic today. Now run your tongue along the inside of the teeth in the front of your mouth, in the upper jaw. What does that tooth surface feel like? Is it, is it smooth or does it have topography? Your incisors may well look like the upper incisors shown here. The tongue side of your incisors may be folded like what you see here in this photograph. Now we call this structure incisor shoveling. It was first noted more than a hundred years ago now incisor shoveling, it varies in degree, but it's really hard to measure. So instead of taking a direct measurement, dental anthropologists assign a numerical score to reflect that degree of expression. So zero shown in purple on the left corresponds to an incisor with, an, with absolutely no shoveling, very smooth on that surface. And a score of seven shown in red on the right corresponds to strongly shoveled incisors. Now, let's look at some data to see how incisor shoveling varies around the world. <clears throat> On this map, I plotted pie charts representing more than 40 human populations and more than 5,000 people. These are data collected over decades of research by my colleague and co-author, Richard Scott. Now, each pie chart shows the occurrence and the degree of expression of incisor shoveling in that population. The orange and red colors indicate the proportion of that population with a strong amount of incisor shoveling. And the blue colors represent people with little to, to no shoveling. You will immediately notice <laughs> that incisor shoveling is very common in the indigenous people living in the Western hemisphere. Shoveling is fairly common in Northeastern Asia, and it is much less common in Southeast Asia. Incisor shoveling is quite rare in Africans and Europeans, so much so that I did not even bother putting them on the map. <laughs> Geneticists have conducted genome-wide association studies in order to identify genetic variants that may influence variation in this dental trait, along with many other, uh, um, much other variation in the anatomy. Now in populations from China and South Korea and Japan, the ectodysplasin A receptor gene, EDAR for short, has shown a strong association. And in particular, the variant of this gene that codes for the amino acid alanine instead of valine, and we call this the V370A allele. 
Kimura and colleagues scored individuals for people for their incisor shoveling and genotyped each person for their EDAR gene. Did they have one, two, or no copies of the V370A allele? Now on this graph, the incisor shoveling score for each individual is plotted on the x-axis of in a histogram. The shading of the bars in the histogram indicate the genotypes of the individuals. So people with two copies of the V370A allele are indicated in black. You'll notice that they tend to have a higher degree of incisor shoveling. People who are heterozygous for the V370A allele are shown in gray. These people have just one copy of the variant, and you see that they tend to have a lower degree of incisor shoveling than the people who are homozygous. Now, people who do not have the V370A allele are indicated by the white bars, and they tend to have very low levels of incisor shoveling. Now, let's pause for, for a moment from thinking about teeth, because I want to tell you more about this allele, the V370A allele. Numerous evolutionary genomic studies have found an interesting geographic distribution for this allele. It is very rare to non-existent in Europe and Africa, Western Asia, Southeast Asia, as you can see on this map in the various shades of blue. Now the red in the pie charts indicate where V370A is found in Eastern Asia and in the Western hemisphere. The allele is estimated to have arisen about 30 to about 35,000 years ago. Now this pattern, it's striking, and it suggests that perhaps it is the result of something interesting evolutionarily. Again, several genomic analyses um, have also, several genomic analyses that are, are designed to identify selection they have found that that geographic pattern is the result of very intense of a very intense bout of selection on for V370A about 20,000 years ago. But selection for what? Now, in order to answer that question, we need to know where the selective event occurred. Based on the genomic data, which is all from living human populations, geneticists estimate that it was 20,000 years ago and that it was in what is now China. But is that right? I have replotted those allele frequencies and put them on this map that matches the map that you saw earlier for incisor shoveling. And the yellow in these pie charts indicate the frequency of the V370A allele in these populations. I want to emphasize that these are living populations. We, for this conversation, are curious about a selective event that happened 20,000 years ago. About 500 years ago, there was a huge demographic event that dramatically altered the genetic variation of people in the Western Hemisphere, and that is European colonization. So is it possible to figure out what the allele frequency of V370A was before European colonization obscured the evolutionary history of the Americas a bit? Yes we can use the dental evidence as these data reflect the occurrence of incisor shoveling in populations before European colonization of the Western Hemisphere, because these are data from archeological assemblages. So let's now compare the modern genomic data with our historical incisor shoveling data. Now remember, a shoveling score of four or greater is strongly associated with being heterozygous or homozygous for the V370A allele. So what we can infer from the dental data in the bottom figure is that 
The V370A allele was very common in the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, much more so than what was observed in Northeast Asia. This strongly suggests that the selective event 20,000 years ago that brought V370A to such a high frequency, that that event was much more likely tied to the population that was ultimately the source for the migration event into the Western Hemisphere. Now, people first migrated into the Western Hemisphere about 16,000 years ago, and they primarily came from populations living in the Arctic of Siberia and Beringia. Now, people first moved into the Arctic region about 35,000 years ago, and from what we can discern from the archaeological record, they inhabited northern Siberia and perhaps regions a bit to the east and a bit to the west from there. Now, as the Earth started to go into that, light, that last ice age about 24,000 years ago, those geographic regions that far north, they would have been, become increasingly colder and increasingly very dry. And increasingly, that meant that it was impossible for people to survive there. Now, this climatic shift was happening on a global scale, as we all know. And we see in populations all across Eurasia, people moved south and into refugia. From what we can reconstruct, the people living in the Siberian Arctic, they did this too. And one region that they may well have moved into is Beringia. Today, Beringia does not look like much of a refuge for terrestrial animals, but remember, during the last ice age, sea level was almost 120 meters lower than it is today. So Beringia was an exposed landmass with relatively a mild climate. Many plants and animals we know took refuge there, and it appears that humans might have done so too. A population of people living on Beringia, they would have been isolated. The tundra to the west, the ice sheets to the east, that would have meant that this population lived in genetic isolation for about five to 10,000 years. And we see evidence in the mitochondrial genomes of this period of isolation having occurred in the history of, of people in the Western Hemisphere and in um, Northeastern Asia. So the people, these ancient Beringians, they would have lived in a place that looked much like this for about five to 10,000 years. There is plenty of biological written, richness for them to survive and to thrive, but don't be tricked. This, what you're looking at, is an extreme environment. It is extreme because of how far north it is. The region of this region of the world, it receives very little ultraviolet radiation from the sun. All living creatures need ultraviolet radiation in order to survive, as we rely on this radiation to initiate that biosynthesis of vitamin D in our bodies. The less ultraviolet radiation you are exposed to, the less vitamin D your body can make on its own. The reduction in ultraviolet radiation exposure that people have in these higher and higher latitudes, it underlies the variation that we see in human skin, pigment skin pigmentation. So this map created by Nina Jablonski and George Chaplin shows the intensity of ultraviolet radiation across the Earth's surface. The purple and blue colors shown where the radiation is the most intense. So in these equatorial regions, darker skin pigmentation is selected for because it filters the radiation and lessens its damaging effects. Now in the higher latitudes, where you see red and green and yellow, there is much less ultraviolet radiation. In these regions on the map where you see the light, the light dots, <laughs> um, multiple times as people migrated into these geographic regions, lighter skin pigmentation was selected for because it allows more of the ultraviolet radiation 
to pass through the upper layers of skin and penetrate to the deeper layers where vitamin D synthesis is initiated. In the even higher latitudes, as you get into the, the subarctic and the Arctic, notice that the dots are much closer together. These regions are where these dots, these closer together dots, um, indicate regions where people cannot biosynthesize enough of their own vitamin D from ultraviolet radiation exposure to survive. Lightening the skin can only get people so far north and at those upper latitudes, people need to innovate so that they could get their vitamin D primarily from their diet. And indigenous cultures in the Arctic have highly specialized diets. They fish for salmon and they hunt for marine mammals and they eat reindeer and lichen, all of which are sources of vitamin D. Now you were probably asking yourself, how does this relate to shuffle-shaped incisors? Great question. Now let's return to teeth. As you have already learned, as you know, the EDAR gene has a significant influence on the shape of our incisors. This gene and the V370A variant also have a significant influence on other parts of our bodies from hair thickness to sweat glands to mammary glands. Now this may seem odd at first. How could a gene that influences teeth also influence such a mixed assortment of other anatomical features? Hair, teeth, sweat glands, and mammary glands, they are all what we call ectodermally derived structures. They all develop from the same embryonic process very, very early on during development, when a baby is still growing in its mother's womb. The ectoderm is the outer layer of the developing organism. And from this, all of those features develop. This most, th that most outer layer of the ectoderm is called the epithelium. And hair, teeth, sweat, and mammary glands, they are all epithelially derived structures. They all develop from the same basic developmental process. Therefore, a gene that influences the development of one of these can influence all of them, a phenomenon that we call pleiotropy. Now the influence of the EDAR gene results from its role in how epithelial cells are joined together. The EDAR gene produces a protein that helps to hold these epithelial cells together um, tightly. Now, specifically the V370A allele, it causes this junction shown here with the yellow arrow, it causes the desmosomal junction not to be held as tightly. And so it loosens that connection between epithelial cells just a little bit. And that one shift in how tightly epithelial cells hold together has effects across all of these anatomical regions. Now, although we know quite a bit about how EDAR influences hair thickness and incisor shape, and even the density of sweat glands in humans, we actually know much less about how it influences human mammary glands. This just hasn't been studied yet, but we do have insight from studies on mice. Three labs have genetically engineered mice to have the human V370A allele in their genomes. The mice that have one or two copies of this allele show an increase in the ductal branching of their mammaries. And what you're looking here, um, those pink structures are mammary glands of mice. Now, you can see a histogram over on the right-hand side of the screen. And notice that the increase in ductal branching increases a little bit with the presence of one copy of V370A, and it increases much more when an ind individual has two copies of V370A. And that gradual increase is exactly what we saw with incisor shoveling, a dosage effect. Now my colleagues and I are pursuing a couple of different research directions to test the hypothesis that V370A has a significant effect on human mammary glands. 
Our hypothesis is that the V37D allele increases ductal branching in the mammary gland during that embryonic stage of mammary gland development, the same time that teeth are forming. We propose that this increased ductal branching facilitates nutrient transfer from the body into the milk that is being produced. Now, other scientists have proposed that the selection for EDAR V370A is tied to sweat glands um, or, or maybe teeth. But as an evolutionary biologist, I argue that the most likely phenotypic target of selection is the one most closely tied to reproductive success. So I ask you, which one is most of these anatomical features is most closely tied to reproductive success? Hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the mammary glands, of course. Prior to the invention of infant formula, infants were completely dependent on milk from their mothers for survival. In geographic regions where there is not enough ultraviolet radiation for humans to biosynthesize vitamin D, nursing infants would also be entirely dependent on their mothers for vitamin D in addition to all of their other dietary needs. And so however much I love to study teeth, <laughs> My colleagues and I concluded that the strong selection on EDAR V370A was due to selection on mammary gland function rather than teeth, as the transfer of vitamin D from mother to baby would have been under immense environmental pressure at such high latitudes. But this does not mean that we no longer study teeth. Absolutely, that's not true. <laughs> So, um, thanks to pleiotropy, the morphological variation of teeth reveals more than just the evolution of the dentition. Some of the variation in tooth shape may well be telling us about the evolution of these other anatomies. I'm particularly interested in exploring what dental variation might be able to tell us about the evolution of the mother-infant relationship fossils of our closest ancestors, they show variation in their incisors that I think is pretty intriguing. For example, Thania's director, Dr. Maria Martinez Torres, her research in one of my all-time favorite papers, amongst many other things, she showed a range of incisor shoveling in early human ancestors, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo antecessor, and Homo georgicus, this shoveling that you see here, it's different than what we see in modern humans, but perhaps it resulted from a similar genetic mechanism. Perhaps that mechanism also leads to variation in the bonds between epithelial cells. Hmm, so much to think about. And I am very much looking forward to joining the research group at the NEA where we can explore these ideas and so much more. So as I come to the end of this update to Darwin's thoughts about human teeth, um, we see that Darwin's third observation was, was right. <laughs> the dentition can provide a lot of insight about human evolution, but perhaps he would be surprised to learn that teeth tell us about so much more than male aggression. We can learn about diet, about life history, and given what we have recently learned about incisor shoveling, perhaps teeth can also give us insight into the evolution of the mother-infant bond. Darwin may also be surprised to learn that natural selection has been critical to recent human evolution, much, much more so than men's opinions of female beauty. So an important update to evolutionary biology since Darwin's time is that we have discovered that women were central in the evolutionary past, and they are central to the science of evolutionary biology today. And so with that, Senor Darwin, we all wish you happy birthday. Gracias. Make sure that I acknowledge all of my, my co-authors and uh, funding sources. Thank you.
Thank you, Leslie. This was a great, great lecture. It was so exciting and so many things and so many ideas that I think are very enlightening for everyone. And I would say especially for dental anthropologists, you are giving us a lot to think about. You know, it, it is very exciting and very appropriate. But I think it's also very beautiful the way you are opening the field of exploration that teeth can provide you know it's something else as you were saying that beyond dentition we can really explore things related to development and adaptations that are much wider than just the dentition itself so i think this is a very interesting pleiotropy it's a whole new world we should be diving into so i think it's great we have now the possibility if people are interested in, in, in asking questions, but if not, just in the meantime, I have questions. I am very oh. curious about <laughs> your topic. Yeah, because um, this is a very exciting topic. And at the same time, for a dental anthropologist, it's a bit worrying <laughs> because it really raises a lot of concerns to what extent we have been right in the way we have used dental features to explore taxonomy and phylogeny, you know? So what's your general feeling about the way we use dental features, you know? Because we may be putting together in the same box some traits that, you know, that are adapted, but in general, we assume that most of our dental features are under neutral selection, but it may be not the case. So, so how do you see in general that dental anthropology is really using or properly using teeth to explore, uh, I would say, phylogeny mostly? I don't think we need to worry too much. No? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think there have been, there've been a number of papers recently that have that have really done that genotype-phenotype association um, and explored whether or not there it, the, most of the variation is due to um, sort of just random um, sort of its neutral neutral um, variation, and it looks like most of the most of the variants are. Uh, my 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 gut feel right now is that it is the traits that are related um, to the, this EDAR V three seventy A variant that are probably the ones that we should pull out of basic dental anthropology studies when the ones where the goal is to understand population relationships and affinities. Um, but I think that that's there are probably not very many traits that have actually been selected on. Um, okay. But I, I, I definitely want to explore that. <laughs> that <would be> very... <laughs> First on the list. Yeah, because in a way I was also wondering when you're talking about shovel shape, to what extent if, if they are the sort of, because of pleiotropy, like the side effect no, of having selected another feature, in this case related with the, with the function of the mammary glands. The thing is that, is it really shovel shape or maybe you should be thinking why they're, for example, that's what we usually call the mass additive traits, no? So it's like increasing the, the, the cell proliferation. So you're having shovel shape and you're having dental tubercles and you're having ridges. So it's maybe we should be exploring those that usually we think that go linked or associated. Yes, absolutely. And actually Richard Scott has, um, he has been working with um, a student of his um, has been working to, to, kind of pin down what those other traits may well be in the dentition, those mass additive traits that go with that. So we're we're chipping away at that now. Okay, this is very, very interesting and very necessary for us. You know, it's, it's a bit of a scary to what extent what we are doing with dental features. So we have here some comments and here we have one question from Mario and says thank you for fantastic talk in this awesome day. I see the relation between v 370 a and incisor shape but could it be any relation between this variant with molar size or any other teeth? Um, there is oh you know there there is another um, part in the post canine that is associated with v 370 a and I'm and I'm so sorry. I'm forgetting exactly what it was because I've been so focused on the incisor shoveling. Um, but Richard Scott has been working on that a bit. Um, in terms of basic size variation, uh, the work that that I've been doing on that suggests that that size variation is actually a different um, has a different biological uh, um, um, source to it. Uh, so I think that these these extra little traits like incisor shoveling, shoveling extra ridges, extra cusps, the, I think those are two separate, very different things in terms of the underlying biology. Um, so I, that's the other thing is is looking at the dentition um, 
um, different traits at different times for different questions and and making sure that the 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 variation that you're looking at is actually reflecting the biological underpinnings you're interested in understanding. That's great. So, well, we have a lot of thank you and congratulations for an amazing lecture and congratulations for Darwin Day. And oh, okay. um, here there is a question which I would say is quite difficult. <laughs> so it's like, what will be the most probably evolution of the human teeth? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good you mean going forward <laughs> i don't know yeah i guess but you see is the evolution or the future of of the teeth or dentition human dentition i don't know maybe which features you think that they're gonna change change or if there is any specific trend you think that we could expect maybe in the in the future of man you know in, in i don't know many centuries is it will our dentition remain the same or your perspective changes <laughs> Oh gosh, I love I love these kinds of questions because I spend most of my time thinking about the past as we all do. <laughs> so in the future, you know, I bet that we will we will have selection for teeth that um uh are are resistant to all of the pesticides and plastics in in the diet. And cuz we'll have I'll take that up in our bodies and maybe it compromises enamel and so people who have variation genetic variation that make sure their enamel is okay despite the pesticides. Okay, so that's good. So maybe something like histological or chemical, no, instead of I mean, morphological. I mean, okay, <laughs> that's good. That's interesting. Yeah, that's good. So, I don't know if we have more questions. People are very happy and they are liking your talk a lot. If there are no more questions, I have a, <laughs> another one, maybe a final one, and we we'll let you rest in this Darwin day. So it's is it still like worrying me a bit, <laughs> or, or like not worrying in a good sense, you know, it's exciting my imagination. I would like to know your opinion about Neanderthals in particular, because as you know, they are characterized by having this shovel-shaped teeth and it is a classic to, to explain their anterior dentition as a biomechanical adaptation, the anterior loading hypothesis, a reinforcement of the biomechanical properties of teeth for pulling or for biting. So uh, if we take your perspective, we would change in perhaps that radically, like maybe there was not really a selection for a biomechanical advantage and was just simply a, a collateral uh, effect of something else. So What's your feeling or your guts or your interpretation or your preferred hypothesis to explain shovel shaping Neanderthals? Well, I love the Neanderthal one is such a wonderful thing to think about. And it and it, I I I can't get out of my mind the work by La Loesa Fox and colleagues years ago where they looked at the melanocortin 1 receptor um, gene sequence in Neanderthals, and they found that it has a uh, an allele that codes for a protein that um, leads to having lighter skin tone, um, and that this looks like selection uh, for lighter skin tone as these, this population was in this more northern latitude. And so I wonder if there was also, so that's convergent evolution with the lighter skin tones that we see in later Europeans and also we see in, in people in, um, in Eastern Asia. I wonder if we also, with the incisor shoveling, because it looks different, it doesn't, it doesn't look like modern human incisor shoveling, perhaps that's a convergent trait as well in the ectodysplasin pathway. Um, and it'll be very fun to explore that. And, and I'm thinking with um, uh, um, the, you know, your last Darwin Day speaker, <laughs> you know, T Tomas Marquez and his work in paleoproteomics that perhaps we can, we can test that hypothesis using paleoproteomics. Well, I think this is, uh, uh, okay, we have another question here. <laughs> I wanna say, so it's like, uh, from Cecilia says, do you think that the presence of more pronounced reaches and more complex morphologies could influence the thickness of the namel? Yes, yeah, it, well, I think it, it does, doesn't it? Um, you know, in terms of a total mass of enamel, um, sometimes it's associated with the dental enamel junction structure, but it's an amplification of that. And so you, I think you do end up with a total, the total amount of enamel being greater. Okay. So another one from Maria says like, following the latest question by Cecilia, could it be any relation between that gene and the daily secretion of enamel? 
by the ameloblast in those areas of the incisors? Yeah, so my understanding is that they're not genetically linked, um, that the, the enamel deposition is, is a different mechanism. So what's happening with the V370A and the epithelial cells is that as the teeth are, are forming, that because the structures, the, the cells don't hold as tight together, that they can split apart as they're moving into the mesenchyme, the, this other tissue. And that's how you end up with this more um, more complicated looking to topography is just because the, the cells, as they move into another territory, they, they break apart more easily. And so that's long before you actually have enamel being deposited in terms of the, the stages of tooth development. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so that's good. And well, from what I was getting from your talk in general, I have the feeling, I don't know what you think, that indeed for recent populations, but also in the past, it seems that vitamin D, the need for vitamin D has been a, a very strong driving force, isn't it? No, for many aspects are related to trying to, to select for this vitamin D. That's what it. That's what it increasingly seems like from the skin color, um, and and you know we're we've just posed this hypothesis about the milk content, and that it's vitamin D. Um, you know, the other thing that comes into it that might might make it a little bit more complicated is that there's been selection on the fatty acids, so the the fads gene cluster as well, and I wonder if when you get that far north, there might actually be an inter uh, an interrelationship between the fatty acids, which are essential for how cells are just made to begin with, and with nutrient transfer and with vitamin D, and that perhaps there, there may be some compensatory mechanisms. And so it might not be, vitamin D might be part of the picture, but not the main or the only part of that picture. There's still a lot of work to be done to figure out exactly what the interrelationships are. In this case, I think it's great that there is a lot of work to be done and you are coming with us and joining us because we really have a lot of exciting things to do, you know. I have a lot of questions now about many traits and, and features and I think it's, it is great. And Well, I just have to thank you for joining us today, for really making another wonderful Darwin Days lecture and because you are really sparking our minds and giving us a lot of new ideas and, and questions that we are so happy to think that we will manage to answer with you with us here Leslie and thank you very much in the name of all of us and the Thenie thank you to all of you who have been joining us and celebrating Darwin's Day even if he had his special considerations about women <laughs> but okay <laughs> we also like very much everything the whole world he opened for our research to to show what we can also do and Leslie is is a great example for that and well Go and celebrate happy Darwin's Day, Leslie. Muchas gracias. Gracias a ti, Leslie. Adios. <laughs>